Speed is a desirable drug for our flesh, but slow is a necessary nutrient for our spirit. God isn't trying to hurt you to slow you down. He's trying to slow you down so you don't hurt you. You don't get extra credit for getting somewhere early. You just get to wait longer. Listen to me. It is literally impossible to be early or late when we walk with God. I get it. What God's called you to is big and weighty and you feel like you're running out of time. You don't need to speed up. I am pretty sure you actually need to hurry up by slowing down. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to The Leader's Cut. For those of you for whom this is your first time to join the conversation, what's going on? It's great to have you with us this episode. Uh, Can I just say that the burden I feel that the Lord has given me to teach this is some kind of hot, like scald your scalp kind of hot. Uh, And and so let me just say at the very onset of this, uh, if you like lying to yourself, you should probably turn off this episode immediately because you're only going to be overwhelmed with conviction if you watch this one. But for those of us who know the essential nature of supernatural surgery on our hearts and in our lives. For those of us who know, we must have it because we need it. Because that surgery makes more room for everything God wants to do in us and through us. Well, we know what we got to do. We got to get up on that surgery table of heaven, the operating table of heaven, and we've got to allow the Spirit of God to cut on us. So let's pray, and we will jump into this episode. Spirit of the living God, you are the savage of heaven. It is all I can do to try and wrap my mind around the fact that the same power The same Spirit who raised Christ from the dead lives in me. Talk about a cheat code. (laughs) I just hear you saying to someone who right now, this week, has been asking, how am I going to do this? Holy Spirit, you're responding by saying, you are not, I am. (laughs) I literally love it when you're in this mode and I just get to sit back and enjoy watching you do what I can't do. So Holy Spirit, I ask, wherever they are, whatever they are doing, whoever they are, no matter how unknown or how famous they seem to be. Holy Spirit, would you pour out upon every one of them a measure of yourself they have never experienced before? May it happen right now. Because with all my heart, I feel like the hound of heaven is is standing before us all, shouting, stop, because we're all doing it wrong. Holy Spirit, help us and cut on us anywhere and everywhere where we are moving too fast where you are not. It is in Jesus' matchless name that I pray this prayer. Amen. (laughs) You know, if we've taken about four minutes to 
just spent a little time praying together. This, this I, I just, I don't, I don't want to overpromise. I'm, I'm just saying, if this thing goes any, uh, any way like it did when I was preparing for it, um, it's it's just going to be a lot to handle. So I hope you have something to take notes with. There's some really uh, supernaturally strong one-liners in this message. And there are probably some passages of scripture that you need to write down that you need to spend a little time this week studying out and meditating upon. All right? Okay. Obviously, you saw by the thumbnail, we're talking about a problem I think many, if not most of us, struggle with way too much. Moving too fast. In my opinion, I'm pretty sure we are all moving way too fast. And what we're going to talk about is... Uh, a, a lot of the why so that we can understand what to do about it. And then at the end, I'm going to give you uh, a pathway, a guide to uh, really just using a couple of things, making room for a couple of things in your life. Uh, I believe if you do these things, the pace of your life will supernaturally slow down and look more like God's pace. As we jump into this conversation, I want to remind you of a thought that I want you to be mindful of through this whole episode so that as we have this conversation, we're both on the same page, all right? Here is the um, perspective with which I'm entering this conversation and the angle by which I am coming at this conversation. It's this thought right here. The slow pace is the most blessed pace. But the fast pace is the most stressed pace. To me, the biggest question we need to answer in this episode is why? We all admit we hurry way too much. That's, that's not a question, do we? The million dollar question is, why do we hurry? And I'm going to give you several reasons. <laughs> Here's the first one. And it's designed to make you laugh a little bit, but also to get your attention. Reason number one, I believe we hurry is this. Because we're idiots. <laughs> because we're idiots. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 12 says, There is a way that seems right to a man. But in the end, it actually leads to death. Have you ever been so convinced that what you were doing was right, that you were willing to fight about it? You were willing to yell about it? You were willing to walk away from certain things or relationships because of it? Have you ever been so convinced that your perspective was right that you were willing to bet the farm. Scripture says, not in the form of a question, because I would have asked it in the form of a question. I would, I would have said, have you ever felt so right, but then in the end you learned you were wrong? Scripture does not give us this truth in the form of a question. It gives us this principle in the form of a statement. There is a way that seems right to Preston. But in the end, it leads to death every time. Okay, let's try and apply this principle to our conversation about pace. The way that seems right unto man isn't just a path. It's a pace. See, I think when we read this passage in Proverbs 14, we just think, oh, yeah, it, like there's a direction that man heads that it's wrong. And it probably just means any direction that isn't towards God. OK, is that true? Yes. Any direction away from God is wrong. Absolutely. But how many times have we learned in Scripture that when God speaks very rarely, if ever, when he says something, is he only saying one thing? He can say one thing 
and be communicating millions of things. And I believe with this verse, he's doing just that. God's not just talking about the literal path. I believe God is also talking about the way. Okay, because some translations say there's a path. I I like the, the NIV because it says there's a way. So that can be the literal path, but it can also be the way I walk on the path. Another way to say it, the pace. Now, I want you to connect this thought to what God says about himself in comparison to us and us in comparison to himself. Isaiah chapter 55, verses eight and nine. My thoughts, God says, are nothing like your thoughts, Preston. And my ways, okay, remember, I just told you there is a way that seems right unto man. God says, Preston, not only is your way wrong, let me help you understand something about my way. My ways are far beyond anything you could even imagine, son. For just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. I want you to think about this. Is this how I felt the Lord give it to me? Uh, Preston, can you see the highest height of the heavens from where you're standing on the earth? No, Lord, of course I can't. Okay. Every time you think about your way, even and especially when you feel most right, Every time you think about your way, which seems right, and compare it to my ways, Preston, it's like you standing on the earth, not being able to see the highest height of the heavens. My ways are infinitely higher than that above yours. Okay. When I was 19, 18, 19, 20, I thought I always had to be right. And so you measure yourself by the conviction with which you walk. And then you kind of start to think, well, the people who are really doing this life well are the ones who are running the fastest. Because if, if they didn't have conviction that what they were doing was right, they'd be walking, kind of feeling their way around rather than sprinting. And so one of the ways I have to prove that I'm convinced or convicted that what I'm doing is right is I sprint and wrong, wrong. There's a way that seems right to mankind. And in my opinion, that way always involves an ungodly pace. Now I want you to think about this for a sec. I want you to imagine, okay, just before God sends you out, to go do your calling on the earth. You approach the father and you say, God, I I don't wanna screw this up. I take you seriously, I exalt you, I wanna please you, I wanna obey you, and the last thing I wanna do is screw up what you give me to do on the earth. What if you then said to God, so God, will you Tell me, what's the fastest way I could screw this up? What if God's response was this? It just answered your own question. Don't go too fast. What if God actually said, the fastest way for you to screw the calling I've given you up is to go too fast? as you do it. What if God said that to you? Newsflash, he did. Let me read you two passages. Proverbs 19, verse two. Whoever makes haste with his feet, hurries, watch, misses his way. Here's Preston's paraphrase of Proverbs 19, verse two. Those who move too quickly often move incorrectly. Proverbs chapter 21 verse 5 says, the plans of the diligent lead surely to abundance. But everyone who is hasty 
moves too fast, comes only to poverty, the opposite of blessing. They lose it. Here's how I would say this, and this is one of my favorite one-liners of this episode. Speed is a desirable drug for our flesh, but slow is a necessary nutrient for our spirit. Why? How? Why is slow a necessary nutrient for my spirit and yours? That's pretty easy to explain. Slow is a necessary nutrient for our spirit because slow is the pace of God's spirit. Think about this. The one, him, the one who could move infinitely fast is the one who moves excruciatingly slow. <laughs> Don't you just love that about God? He, he, we all want him to speed up. And yet he says, oh no, I move slow. What if I gave you a choice? All right, this is going to seem random for a sec, but track with me. What if I gave you a choice? Between fast food for the rest of your life, every meal for the rest of your life, or a 10-course meal from a world-class chef, which would you choose? Probably most of you, especially in the foodie culture day in which we live, most of you are going, I'd take that. 10 course meal, every meal from a world class chef for the rest of my life. I want you to just think about this for a second. Then why do so many of us drive through fast food all the time? Well, Preston, because no one's giving me the option for a 10 course meal from a world class chef. And so I just drive through and get food fast. Listen to me there is no meal which can be ordered in a drive through which will ever taste as good as a four hour meal with 10 courses prepared by a world-class chef. But I want to take this even further, all right? Because I'm trying to kind of point out that many of us have just programmed our brains to do everything quickly, including our food. But what if you chose the 10-course meal from a world-class chef every meal for the rest of your life, all right? So, So you made the right choice. But what if? You literally devoured every course in one bite. Just, just like a, a 13, 14, 15 year old teenager, okay? You just devour every course in one bite. Well, could you say that you were really even enjoying an incredible meal? The incredible meal wouldn't even taste all that incredible to you. Why? Because you're not eating it right. The supernatural life must be savored slowly. You cannot live a supernatural life and sprint. So don't be an idiot. God has given you a beautiful life which will only taste bitter if you consume it too quickly. Slow your roll. Second reason, in my opinion, why we hurry as much as we do. Reason number two, because we think it's admirable. We are actually convinced that fast is heroic. I'll show it to you in scripture. There's a picture that Paul paints that honestly, I think can be used as an excuse to run too fast. Uh, If it's used out of context, this is really, this passage in, in 1 Corinthians 9 is really a passage on preparation, on discipline, not on speed or pace, all right? Let me read it to you, verse 24. Don't you realize that in a race, Everyone runs, but only one person can get the prize. So run to win. 
Here's how most of us internalize this verse. Okay, well, if everyone runs the race and only one person can win, and I'm supposed to run the race to win, who wins the race if only one wins the race everybody runs? Here's what most of us would say, the fastest. The person who wins the race is, the race is always the fastest. This is not at all true, but this is actually what we're trained going all the way back to grade school. Remember how many times uh, one of the biggest things on the playground was to see who was fastest? Do you remember this? Hey, let's race. I'll race you after school. Let's see who's the fastest. I bet I can beat you. And winning was defined by speeding. And the message that we were sent, probably uh, for many of us going back to a very early age, is this. Losers are slow. And slow people always lose. This is insanity. And Solomon, the wisest man who has ever lived, says in Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 11, these words, I have observed something else under the sun. The fastest runner doesn't always win the race. Remember, reason number one, why we hurry? Because we're idiots. Those of us who believe and are convinced that losers are slow are literally arguing with the wisest man who ever lived and recorded these words by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. The fastest runner does not always win the race. Here's how I would say it. Every race has a divine pace. Any pace other than the divine pace is a losing pace. There, every uh, life has seasons, all right? And every season has a different pace. Every relationship is in a different season, which means every relationship has a different pace. Every race has a divine pace. And listen to me. The divine pace is the winning pace. We need to stop walking around believing that the fastest pace is the most divine pace. First Thessalonians chapter. 4 verse 11 says, Preston, and this is paraphrasing obviously, and we're in this conversation, so I'm connecting this to what we just read from Paul. Preston, if we're going to talk about goals, and the goal being to win the race, let me add another goal to your life. Make it your goal to live a quiet life. Minding your own business and working with your hands, just as we instructed you before. Here's the picture I get as it relates to a quiet life and us bringing this verse on a quiet life into our conversation about a fast pace. Here's how I would say it. Fast is loud. Slow is quiet. Preston, make it your goal to live a quiet life with a slow pace. Do not make it your ambition to live a loud life. It's going to have to move too fast. The louder you allow your life to get, the more people have to see. And we've talked about the perception of man, the fear of man on previous episodes. The more you allow all that stuff to creep in, the louder life gets. Let me say it like this. I, in the... The amounts of time I spent on a yearly basis, spend on a yearly basis counseling people, I will tell you a fairly decent amount of time people will talk about hearing voices. 
Now we're not doing this episode on the demonic and and being taunted by the enemy, but here's what I would say. Fast is always loud. Just met with somebody this last week and I mean, we sit down together and it's and then he says, I feel like I'm hearing voices. You think? You need to go find some still waters where the only voice you can hear is the voice of the living water. But if you build a loud life, the only way to survive is to run fast. The scripture says, make it your aim to live a quiet life. Fast is loud. Slow is quiet. There was something as I was preparing for this that I didn't see coming a verse and a principle that I felt the Lord attached to the verse related to um, for those of us uh, who have families and the pace of our work is far too fast because we were convinced or have become convinced that that fast pace is admirable, not just to outsiders, but to our family members. I felt like the Lord just slid a post-it note for those of us who are in that place right now. And I've been there. I don't feel like I'm there right now. I don't think. I'm pretty sure my wife would tell me. Uh, but this is a little post-it note for any of us who might be there right now. One of the fastest ways to lose your family is to move at a pace faster than they can handle. Genesis chapter 33, this one verse is going to seem really random but I'll, I'll help connect it to our conversation. I understand the context of this verse and that Jacob is essentially using what I'm about to read to you that he says to Esau, Jacob's using it as kind of a ploy for distance Jacob felt he needed so he didn't get killed, okay? So I, I totally get the context. But out of nowhere, I just felt the Lord uh, throw this one into my lap just to submit to you. Genesis 33, verse 14. Jacob says to Esau, please, my Lord, you go ahead of your servant. He was talking about himself. We will follow slowly at a pace that is comfortable for the livestock and the children. This hit me when the Lord gave it to me. And, And the Lord connected it to for me this week, okay? As I'm filming this, this is the week of Easter. Uh, I don't know when you're seeing it, but I'm filming it the week of Easter. Typically, pretty busy week for someone in my line of work in the seat in which I sit. Uh, And one in this seat in the midst of this week could easily make the case this is one of the biggest, if not the biggest week of the year in my job. And so I got to do as much as I can uh, to do everything I can. And so I just sprint my ever loving tail off this week. And a couple of days ago, I'd come home from a really long day at the office. And I was in my mind thinking, I need to rest because this is a really crazy week and I just need to have as much in my tank as possible. And I felt. The Holy Spirit, just out of nowhere, prompt me and say, go into your son's room. It it was late. I think it was probably almost 10 o'clock. And I go into my son's room. He's still awake. And we just start talking. And he starts asking me questions about our faith in Jesus. And my other son comes into the room and lays at the foot of the bed where I was laying, my son was laying, and we're just hearts open, minds open, just going wherever. And while I did keep them up a little bit too late, because the more we talked, the more my heart was overflowing. As I walk out of their room to go to bed, and on paper, Now I have the opportunity for a few hours of less of sleep that I was convinced I needed in order to be ready for the next day in this really busy and important week. But I actually went to bed 
after midnight, feeling completely full. And I felt the Holy Spirit just say, this is what happens when you go slow. Probably had what right now feels like one of the best conversations I've had with my sons, possibly in several years. So here's the question that you might be asking as we look at Genesis 33, verse 14. You look at your pace and you look at the pace of your family. You might be asking this pace. So what's the best pace for our family? Here's the answer. The pace of the slowest in your family. The best pace for your family is the pace of the slowest in your family. You hear a phrase in the military quite often, no man left behind, no woman left behind. Okay, if the military takes their bond with one another when they are not blood so seriously that they say, nobody's getting left behind, we will slow down to the slowest because we will not leave you alone where the enemy can get you. If that's how they approach their pace, how must a godly family approach their pace? I believe this is how. You find the best pace for your family by knowing what the slowest pace of the slowest person in your family is. I'm not saying slow as a negative thing. Well, they're so slow. Now, all of us are slow in different seasons. And when I'm, I'm using the word slow in this context, what I'm saying is where you feel like you can't run any faster. So the whole episode is about intentionally slowing down. But there's also slow when you feel like you can't even go faster. Okay? As a family. I think a great value is we slow down to the slowest pace of the slowest member of the family in every season. That leads us to the third reason why I think we hurry so much of the time. Because we don't want to know where we actually are. Speed in life is actually... I think one of the top excuses for ignorance about oneself. If you've run with me for any amount of time, you know I talk about self-awareness a decent amount. I actually believe that the reason many of us move so fast is because we don't actually want to know where we are. Another way to say it, man is addicted to a fast pace because man is afraid to know where his heart actually is. Most people are too afraid to fail the assessment. And so they never slow down long enough to even take one. Genesis chapter 3, uh, a, a wonderful moment with so much uh, to learn and, and so much that it teaches us. Uh, Genesis 3, verses 8 and 9. I talk about every once in a while because I'm so fascinated with the question God asks Adam. It, 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 uh, I've told, I, I say this all the time. Okay, the question I'm going to read is going to sound like a locational question. But God is the God who knows everything and is everywhere. So there's no way... This was just a locational question. I personally believe it's possible that this was not the first time Adam had been asked this question by God when they would go on walks. Okay, let's walk this out. There's a lot to these two verses, all right? Genesis chapter three, verses eight and nine. When the cool evening breezes were blowing, the man and his wife heard the Lord God walking about in the garden. Okay, before I, I keep going, think about this. They heard God walking. How did they know what God's walk sounded like? I believe it's most likely because they had walked with God enough to know the sound of his walk. <laughs> okay, so they hear the Lord God walking about in the garden. Watch what they do, because remember, this is right after 
they sinned. So they hid from the Lord God among the trees in a bush. Okay, Verse 9, then the Lord God called to the man, where are you? Okay, for those of you who forget this chapter, now you're reminded of the question, where are you? Now it might make more, more sense. How is it possible that the God who knows everything, so he knew where they were because he knows everything about everything, and the God who is everywhere, how could the God who is everywhere not be where they were? God already knew. Okay, I personally believe this was not a locational question. It was actually an emotional question. And I'm, I'm not going to read you anymore, but remember what Adam's response is. We were afraid. And so we hid. I was afraid. And so I hid. Fear is an emotion. God asks the question. Adam answers it. I believe the way he felt the Lord was asking it. Adam doesn't say, we're over here. That's a locational answer. Adam answers emotionally. I was afraid. Where am I? I'm afraid. That's why I hid from you. Here's a one-liner for you connected to this passage. Adam hid from a hard conversation with God in a bush. We hide from hard conversations with God in a hurry. When God wanted to have a hard conversation that Adam knew was coming, Adam jumped into a bush. What do we do? When we know there's a hard conversation God wants to have with us, we don't jump into a bush. We jump into a hurry. We start running. Oh, sorry, Lord. Got too much you've given me to do. Can't slow down to talk. My wife and I, when we were younger in marriage, we used to go run together. But after a number of years, we stopped running together and we started walking around the neighborhood. Want to know why? Because you can't talk when you sprint. We can only understand one another when we walk slowly. Therefore, when we sprint, one of the reasons we sprint and try to never stop so that there's an excuse we have not to talk about where we're actually at. If I had a dollar for every person that I talk to and I say, hey, do you have a counselor? Oh, no, man, I got so much going on and, and I, I just don't have time for that kind of stuff, man, I, I know I need it, but I'll, I, once things slow down, then I'll sit down with a counselor. That's an excuse. The reason we're not slowing down is because we don't want to sit down. Because we know we talk deeply when we walk slowly. But we'll never talk when we never stop. And so, in my opinion, one of the reasons that you and I hurry as much as we do is because we actually know we're not in the best place. I tell you this time and time again, one of the most dangerous types of humans, in my opinion, is a human who doesn't know where they are. But how will we ever know where we actually are if we don't slow down long enough to assess where we are? Listen to me. Stop approaching your life before the Lord as a pass fail. Start to think more about pace than you do even about progress. When we think about progress, typically we end up getting far away from the Lord. We outrun him. But when we think about pace, we are always in close proximity to the Lord. And I believe one of the Lord's favorite things to do 
when we walk slowly together is do what he did in the garden with Adam and Eve. Where are you? I'm afraid, Lord. Hey, Preston, you're going so fast. Slow down. I want to ask you a question. Where are you? Lord, I'm freaking out. Because I don't know how this is all going to work out. I just feel like if I keep running, there's a better chance I'll win this race. And isn't it amazing how clear things get when we slow down? But how blurry things are when we speed up. If I, uh, I, I was in a meeting this week with someone who was struggling with going way too fast, feeling the pressure to go way too fast. And I said, what if I made a deal with you that we, the two of us would take a drive around uh, the loop, the highway of our valley here in Phoenix and I made a deal with you that every sign you could read from the highway, I would give you a million dollars. What would you do? He goes, I would read every sign. Go, okay, next question. What if I gave you two ways to drive around the valley so that you could see all the signs? Option number one, was an Indy race car that goes 225 miles an hour, but you could only go 225 miles an hour. Or I gave you a bike and you could only pedal probably on average less than 10 miles an hour. Which would you choose? He goes, I would take the Indy car. I said, why? He goes, so that I could get the money faster. I said, wrong answer. He goes, how's that the wrong answer? I could make a loop at 225 miles an hour and get all of the money. I said, no, you might be able to go 225 miles an hour, but you know what you wouldn't be able to do? You'd be driving so fast, weaving in and out of cars, going 25% as fast as you. You'd be so focused on not crashing because you were going too fast that in my opinion, you might only be able to see four or five signs on the entire lap. The right answer is, it might take me longer to get all the money. But if I ride that bike, I'll be going slowly enough where I won't miss one sign. See how I tricked him? <laughs> yeah, many of us think, the right answer is just hurry up. We, I need the money now. Hurry up. Get in the Indy race car, 20, 225 miles an hour. Done. No. You'd miss most of the signs. When we move too quickly, we always miss much, especially about ourselves. It is impossible to know where you are when you are weaving in and out of traffic that is going 65 miles an hour and you're going 225 miles an hour. But honestly, it's probably one of the reasons we are driving so fast. It's because we know if we slow down long enough, we'll actually become aware of where we truly are. That leads us to reason number four. Why I believe we hurry so much. Because we power through our pain. Somewhere along the line, we all convinced ourselves that to be human means you must power through pain. Humans experience pain. We don't have time to be slowed down. We have goals to achieve. And if humans experience pain and humans are supposed to accomplish things, well, then the only way to accomplish things as humans who experience pain is to power through our pain. This reminds me of uh, my son's truck. Uh, he actually drives the truck that I used to have for many years. That's a 2001 Ford F-150 King Ranch. And 23 years old, uh, 
right now and has about 240,000 miles on it. And I've, I've owned that truck for 19 years now. Okay. And that truck has cost me less than any other vehicle I have ever owned. Literally other than tires and oil changes, I've probably put less than a thousand, let's call it $2,000 over nearly 20 years. I mean, this truck is like a kiss on the forehead. It has cared for me more than any vehicle ever has or probably will. Okay. And my daughter drove it. it it's the first car for all of my children. But my son, my middle child, um, my daughter, she typically drove slowly uh, for the most part. She knew it was an older truck. She wanted to baby it. I had given her the talk, treat her like a lady, <laughs> and be gentle to her, and she'll be around for a long time. My daughter understood that conversation. My middle child, my oldest son, didn't quite understand this. We have this app that um, I guess you could say tracks everyone in our family. It sounds like a stalker app, but really it's just a safety app. I know many of you who are parents of teenagers, you have this app and it actually gives you reports on everybody's driving in the family. Okay. Fascinating material. It makes for a wonderful uh, family dinner night conversation if, if you have this app. But my, my middle child, uh, I got a report one day of how my son drives my 23-year-old truck with a quarter of a million miles on it. One of the things in the report said that he frequently drives too fast from a complete stop. Another way to say it, he punches it every time. Okay. Now, for those of you who drive really old cars, you know one of the fastest ways to ruin your engine of a very tired vehicle is to literally step on the gas every time the light goes from red to green. My 18-year-old son, this clearly is a habit of his. And you, you know what's happened to the truck? In the year and a half my son has driven that truck, I've had to put more money into that truck than I did in the 18 years of owning it before he started driving it. This is something that many of us, especially the hard drivers, those of us who are just driven and we're convinced that the fastest pace is the godliest pace and we just got to drive through even our own pain. Let me help you understand something. Running through injury only makes the injury increase. The problem is speed hides the wounds of the soul while simultaneously making the wounds worse. Let me say it like this. Hurt hurts, but hurry hurts hurts even worse. You see, pain, I believe, is in part designed by God to slow people down. Have you ever heard people who were going too fast and they knew it, but they didn't want to stop or slow down. Have you ever heard them talk about how they ended up in the hospital with a sickness or an injury, or uh, they got a really bad case of the flu and they were knocked out for like a week and couldn't go to work? Have you ever heard them use the following phrase? The Lord just stopped me in my tracks. He made me rest. Have you ever heard them talk like that? Okay. I believe pain is in part designed by God to slow people down. But for some of us, our fear of more pain is actually part of our purpose for sprinting all of the time. We're actually afraid it will hurt more to slow down and get healing than it will to keep running in the midst of pain. Pain is one of the ways that God created our bodies and our lives to work, where we go, ah, I'm hurting. I, I can't run right now. I need to stop. And so that you hear me correctly, I don't want you to, to hear me as though I'm saying God 
uses pain to hurt you, to punish you. Okay. I'm not saying that. Here's what I'm saying. God isn't trying to hurt you to slow you down. He's trying to slow you down so you don't hurt you. All of us experience pain from time to time. And some of us have some really deep traumas that go many years back. And the reason we've been sprinting all those years isn't because we're amazing. It's actually because we're scared to death to have someone take a look at that wound. And the enemy's gotten involved over the years and said, if you go in for surgery, the surgery is going to hurt that wound more than the person who did it to you. So just keep running. Okay. All of us have experienced pain and will experience pain. It is not heroic to keep running through your pain. Allow God to take your pain as a means to help you slow down to the pace he's trying to get you to move at. Here's the fifth reason why I think we hurry so much because we think we're behind. <laughs> this is a biggie. I talk about this a decent amount. Uh, it's so funny to me. You know, one of the, the reels that so far seems to have done um, probably as well, if not better than almost all the other ones, is a reel about you're not late. And it's so funny to me that millions of people would watch something just to be reminded you can't be late with God. And, and in my opinion, the reason it resonated with so many people is because so many people think when you walk with God, you can still be late. Let's look at the other side of this coin. Something I've learned about God's enemy, the devil, is this. If the devil can't stop you, he'll simply start to hurry you. God's trying to slow us down. Isn't it funny that Satan is trying to speed us up? And the fastest way for the devil to rush you is to get you to believe everyone else is running by you. So let's take a moment. Let's slow down. Let's sit down at the feet of the creator of the universe who divinely enables Solomon, the wisest man, to pen these words by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Ecclesiastes 3 verse 1. There is a time for everything and a season for every activity under heaven. There's a time for everything, Preston. Literally, everything which happens has a time which has been set aside for only it. Every season, every activity. There is a specific time for it all. You are not ready for this next one-liner. You don't get extra credit for getting somewhere early. You just get to wait longer. <laughs> if there's a time for everything, then what does that mean? If you try and speed up the clock and take less time, if there is a time for that thing and you hurry so that you take less time to get there. But God said there is a preordained time for that activity. You know what you're going to do when you get there early? He's going to make you wait. Holla at your boy. Preston, I hate to wait. Well, then maybe you should slow down. Preston, I just feel like I'm always waiting. If there's a time for everything and you're not yet experiencing that time, Maybe it's because you sped through a bunch of other things to try and get where you wanted to get faster. And because you missed a lot of what he wanted you to get, he's making you wait because you will go back and get all those lessons before he allows you to experience the appointed time for whatever it is you tried to hurry up. 
Listen to me. It is literally impossible to be early or late when we walk with God. When God orders my steps, even my stumbles turn into right on time steps when I'm following God at his pace. Think about this. There's a verse in the Bible uh, that many people throw around talking about vision. And when they do their vision boards, this is the verse they write at the top of their, one of the verses they write at the top of their vision board. Write the vision down. Make it plain so that they that read it may run with it. Okay, this is hilarious to me. Well, if I just get vision, the more clear I am on the vision, the faster I can run with the vision. This is insanity. All right, that's so out of context. Let me read you Habakkuk 2, verses 2 and 3. Good God, if you're going to do a vision board, please don't just put Habakkuk 2, 2 on the top of it. Put verse 3 up there to serve as a measure of accountability, not to hurry thyself up. Listen to what this says. Then the Lord said to me, write my answer plainly. Your translation might say, write the vision plainly on tablets so that a runner can carry the correct message to others. This vision is for a future time. Remember, we just read in Ecclesiastes 3, there's a time for everything. I'll paraphrase for me. I'll personalize it for me, just like I want you to personalize it for you by paraphrasing a little bit. Preston, I've given you a vision for your life. I've given you a calling, and I'm letting you see it, but it's for a future time. You can't speed this up. Watch this. It describes the end. Now, I know this, this is about something very specific. I'm using this as a principle for us of how God operates when he gives us clarity, the vision about the call he's given us. This vision describes the end, and it will be fulfilled. Remember, all of his, rever- his words, all of them produce whatever he wants. None of them return to him void. None of them. Everything is fulfilled. If it seems slow in coming, okay, interesting, verse two, we all run around so that they who read it can run with it. If it seems slow in coming, verse three, watch this, wait patiently. For it will surely take place. Watch this next part. It will not be delayed. Wait a minute. Write the vision down so that they that read it may run with it. So I got to get a vision so I can run fast in my life. Not at all what God is saying. Because then God goes further and says, here's what I need you to remember. It's going to happen when I want it to happen. There will be no delay. Even when you're having to wait patiently, when you feel like running quickly. If you're doing what I told you to do. The fulfillment of the vision. The consummation of the plan will not be slow in coming. It might seem slow to you because you're trying to run too fast, Preston. It will not be slow. It might seem slow, but it will not be slow in coming. It will surely take place. It's not going to be delayed. It will happen exactly when I want it to happen, says the Lord. All right, cupcake. Slow down. You're not behind. One of the fastest ways to lose the race that God has given you and you alone to run is to allow the enemy to turn your race into a race against your peers. And the moment you believe you are running a race against your peers, you will be tempted to speed up your pace and run faster than God's pace. When you think you're behind, you will speed up. But when you walk with God, you can only be on time. And slow, so you're comfortable going slow. This brings us to the last reason 
And then I'll give you a, a, a brief rundown of a couple of things that will help you uh, stop hurrying so much. Here's reason number six why we hurry. Honestly, because we want an excuse not to help others. Not going to spend a lot of time here. You know, we, we could go down the story of the Good Samaritan uh, because the picture I get of the Good Samaritan, uh, the two who pass by, hurry by. Why? Because guilt is heavy. Conviction is weighty. And so we try and hurry right through it. We literally, many of us are moving so fast because we literally have convinced ourselves that what we're doing is so important that it can even come at the expense of helping the people we most love in our lives. Remember this, Jesus never ran anywhere. Never. You can't find a verse that said Jesus sprinted. You can't. You can find verses that say, and he was like immediately there. Uh, literally, he, he just, he wasn't there. Now he was there. It's not talking about how fast he got there. It's talking about his ability to supernaturally arrive there. When a second before he wasn't there. Think about this. If Jesus was a sprinter, he never would have stopped at the cross. If Jesus was a sprinter, he would have ran right past the Garden of Gethsemane. If Jesus was a sprinter, he'd be too much of a busybody to be sitting at the right hand of the Father right now. Jesus is not a runner. He's a walker. Think about it like this. How could hurry be a habit of the sun when patience is a fruit of the spirit? <laughs> I don't know if that landed on you. When I got that earlier today, that hit me like a ton of bricks. That hit me like... Eight houses built with bricks. When I just felt the Lord go, Preston, how could hurry be a habit of the sun? When patience is a fruit of the spirit. There is hurt happening all around us, but we cannot see it when we're sprinting right by it. Pain has a pace. Slow. And if you want God to use you to help heal the pain of the people you love most, you're going to have to slow down in order to do anything about it. Why? Because surgery is never speedy. Neither is recovery. We all have people in our lives who are hurting and walking or trying to run in pain and what they really need from us is not for us to say to them hey shake it off you'll be fine let's go come on hurry up what they need is for us to stop everything to slow down so much that we stop it all simply to be with them in their pain what statement does it send about my love for the ones I love. If when they stop due to pain, I keep sprinting by. Here's what you have to remember. Love stops. It's what Jesus did for you. Everything was awesome for him at the right hand of the Father. He stopped. He stopped and made his way to earth. Love stops. Hey, someone touched my garment. Everybody stop. What happened? Someone touched my garment. Love stops. Who, who is that? Short guy in a tree. 
I know I, I've got a lot of things they want me to do. Get down from there. I'm going to stop everything. Because I'm coming to your house today. Love stops. Let me give you a couple of things before we wrap up. Uh, as a practical guide to get rid of all the hurry. All right. To reset the pace uh, that you're running at. To move from a fleshly pace to a divine pace. A couple of things I want to give you. First, in order to slow down, you must make time to rest. Exodus chapter 34, verse 21, God talks about the Sabbath. You have six days each week for your ordinary work. But on the seventh day, you must stop working. Think about that. What is stopping? Going so slow that now you're not even moving. Watch this. I love this. This is for us go-getters. You observed the Sabbath even during the seasons of plowing and harvest. Well, Lord, it's just coming in this year. And so we'll, we'll, we'll catch you in a couple months. And the Lord says, no, you won't. You'll catch me six days from now. You're going to stop. Because one of my favorite things in all the earth is to stop everything I'm doing and spend a day with you. How would it change the way you see the Sabbath if you realized that the one who holds the universe up by the power of his word stopped everything he was doing to spend an entire day with you? I think we would rest more. Listen to this one-liner I felt the Lord give me that's just absolutely savage. A life with rest is not automatically a life with God. But a life without rest is most definitely a life without God. Preston, how can you say that? That if I'm not resting, I don't have God in my life. No, no, no. You're not making room for God in your life. And your lack of rest is the evidence of it. How can I say such a thing? Because Jesus is the one who said, Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, you who are worn out and run down from running too fast. What does he say to them? To us who are running too fast and overwhelmed as a result of it, he says, You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to give you rest. When I don't have rest, I am personally too far from the one who promised to give rest. Life is like a raging sea. That's why our shepherd leads us beside still waters to restore our souls. First thing, in order to get rid of the hurry in your life, make time to rest. Second, make time to pray. I'll read you two verses, a funny moment with Jesus when just after the feeding of the 5,000, uh, Mark chapter 6, verse 45 says, immediately after the feeding of the 5,000, Jesus insisted. So imagine his tone is strong that his disciples get back into the boat and head across the lake to Bethsaida while he sent everybody else home. Verse 46, after telling everyone goodbye, Jesus went up into the hills by himself to pray. This word insisted. Uh, the, there's, there's a word in this passage, uh, in the Greek that literally has the idea of doing something without any delay whatsoever, without any distraction, without any detour, being so committed to seeing that one thing done that you don't let, allow anything else to get in the way. This is what's so funny to me. Jesus hurries everyone else in their hurry away so that he, for a few moments, could slow down and be with his father. Prayer. What is prayer? The way I typically define prayer is like this. Prayer is the most intimate form of communication between God and man. And intimacy has a speed. Slow. Let me kind of ask a little bit of a risque question just to paint a very clear picture. Some of you will catch it and some of you might not. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shoot this shot anyways. 
What would happen if every act of physical intimacy in my marriage was a quickie? What would happen? Here's what I believe would happen. I'd get emptied, but I'd never get filled. <laughs> Some of y'all caught that. What? What? Oh, yeah. Yeah. If every act of physical intimacy in my marriage was a quickie, yep, I'd get emptied. There's no way I'd ever get filled. Why? Because intimacy has a speed and its speed is slow. Man focuses on pace. God focuses on proximity. God cares far less about how fast you move for him than he does about how close you are to him. So if you want to stop hurrying so much, make more time to pray. Prayer has a pace, a cadence all its own, and it is never fast. Here's the third thing. If you want to eliminate the hurry and reset the pace to a more divine cadence in your life. Make time for others. Others will never fit where you never make room for them. Relationship is intentional. And one of the most awesome ways that God fills your tank is when he uses someone else to do it. <laughs> Ever been to a gas station where they had the, they have self-serve and then they have uh, the full service and, and you pull into the full service and someone comes out. You don't even have to get out of your car. You hand them the card. They get your gas. You don't have to do a thing. They clean your windows. They, you need a water. Full service. Pretty great every once in a while. It's like a great massage at a great spa. That's what great relationships are like when you make time for them. One of the most awesome ways God fills your tank isn't by your hand. It's by the hands of those you love when they fill your tank to overflowing. Here's the last thing and we'll wrap up. If you want to eliminate the hurry, you need to make time for promptings. I'm talking about promptings from the Holy Spirit. Galatians chapter 5 verse 16. So I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. If there's one thing, if, if you backed me into a corner and said, Preston, you can only tell me one thing about slowing down my pace to move at God's pace, here's what I would say. Let the Holy Spirit guide your life. The Holy Spirit will prompt you. Preston, go to your son's room. I know it's been a long day. It was a 13-hour day. I know it's been a long Go to your son's room. Trust me. It's going to be a special moment for him. It's going to be a powerful moment for you. It's going to be a relationally significant moment for the two of you. If I would have just come into the house and, and gone, ah, I'm going to bed. I am wiped. I don't even want to eat. I'm done. Good night. I'll see you in the morning. I would have missed what turned out to be maybe one of the biggest building conversations that my sons and I have had in a really long time. Did it happen because I'm the smart one and I knew it was time for one? No. It happened because I'm best friends with the one who knows everything. And he knew it was time. And because I was willing to follow the prompting, I got to receive one of the better gifts he's given me in a long time. If you want to, Get rid of the hurry. If you want to keep hurrying, keep following the promptings of God's enemy. If you want to experience heaven opening up over you because you slowed down to God's pace, then you need to follow the promptings of God's spirit. You want to keep experiencing crazy? Follow the promptings of God's enemy. 
It's not enough. Hurry, do more. You want to experience the blessings of heaven? Follow the promptings of God's spirit. And those promptings, in my experience, always are received most easily when we're moving the most slowly. I want to pray over you. I so enjoy uh, our time together. I love you so much. I love when you jump in the comments. I love when you jump in the DMs. Uh, I just want, I, I'm sure I don't have to say this. I just want, I don't, I don't do any of this because I'm trying to be known. I want you to know, and I, I pray that the Lord w- would search my heart. He knows my heart, but I, I want him to search my heart. I, I'm not doing any of this so that someone will know me for doing something. Genuinely, so many people God has put in my life to help me. And I have gotten to live a completely different life because of their help. I just want to help you in any way God might ever use me and anoint me to come alongside you and help you in this leg of your journey on the earth. I do it because I feel like right now he's pleased with it, but I also do it because I just want to help you. I believe in you, but I need you to hear this. You don't need to speed up the pace. I get it. What God's called you to is big and weighty, and you feel like you're running out of time. You don't need to speed up. I am pretty sure you actually need to hurry up by slowing down. Hurry it up in the area of slowing it down. Don't wait any longer. Let me pray over you, and we'll wrap. God, thank you for every single person who joined this conversation and made it to this point of the conversation. God, it is amazing that you are not some slave driver who forces us to run faster than than we even can run. You, you don't make us do that. You actually force us to go much slower than we can. We could go so much faster, but you force us to go much slower. And you do it out of love. Holy Spirit, would you slow us all down? Help us to see things we've been missing. Help us to hear things you've been repeating, which we haven't been receiving. Holy Spirit, help us find your pace. And for those who are wrestling through any of the whys, which we talked about today, Holy Spirit, I pray you would do a miraculous work in each of their hearts where they're they're experiencing bondage. Would you set the captive free? Where there were scales on their eyes, would you heal the blind eye? And where they were sprinting, because they were too afraid to slow down, because they know the pain they've experienced hasn't been healed. Holy Spirit, I pray right now, you would supernaturally slow them down. and supernaturally heal their hurts. Jesus, you came to set the captive free. You came to heal the brokenhearted. Would you do whatever work needs to be done in the deepest parts of our hearts? Holy Spirit, would you do that work right now? And would you give us a new anointing to run at your pace? In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I love you so 
much. If you're new to the Leader's Cut, jump in the comments. Uh, if you're watching this on a platform that has comments, uh, introduce yourself. It's not just me running in this little group. Uh, there are a lot of amazing people with really big hearts. Uh, let them know where you're from. Let them know you're joining the conversation. And we'll all jump in and walk slowly together beside one another as we follow his spirit. I love you so, so much. And I'll see you next week. Thanks for joining me for this episode of The Leader's Cut. I pray you sense God speak directly to you through it. Before you leave, make sure you hit the subscribe button and tap the bell icon so you're notified every time a new episode is posted. And be sure to share your takeaways and favorite one-liners in the comments. And if you think it could help a friend or two, I'd love it if you would send them the link to share it with them. Thanks again for watching. We'll see you next time.